Welcome, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, to ATU Tech. It's our uh, February uh, 2014 meetup. Um, I'm happy to announce that again we have uh, five presenters, a full ATU Tech. For those of you new to the format, um, we have uh, five companies uh, pitch themselves for five minutes, and then a five minute Q&A for the audience. Um, so eight of our questions are ready. Uh, the other thing I want to mention real quick uh, that I always forget is that I'm Zach. Uh, I'm the uh, uh, organizer of uh, ATU Tech. Uh, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, my day job is uh, Olark uh, uh, here in Ann Arbor, a company that helps uh, live chat, uh, helps you put uh, live chat on your website. Uh, maybe some of you have heard of it. Uh, okay, uh, without further ado, uh, our first uh, presenter is uh, Anthony from Spinflight. Hi, my name is Anthony Montalbano, co-founder of SpinCard. Uh, it's a mobile app that makes it easier to exchange information. Um, but before I get there, I have a few questions for everybody here. Um, how many people forgot their business cards today? I don't have it. Okay. I, I, that's my next um, Who doesn't have business cards, right? Not everybody has business cards. Okay, well how about this question? Let's say I go home tonight and I wake up tomorrow morning with a handful of business cards and I'm into my pocket. And I pull them out and I go, crap, I can't remember whose business card this is. Has that ever happened to you? <coughs> it's kind of embarrassing, but it does happen from time to time. So that was kind of some things that we looked at and we were just like, there's got to be a solution out there, right? There's got to be a digital business card. We have these mobile phones. Um, so we did some research, right? It's why reinvent the wheel something that already exists. Um, and we looked at a lot of different uh, apps out there and we were trying to figure out what works and what doesn't and why they're working or why they're not. And they're really, I mean, today we still use, predominantly, a physical business card. Um, and we wanted to find out why the digital isn't working. So after some research, we kind of determined a few different things. Um, first, we noticed that there's a huge trend with scanning business cards. So we're going from a physical to a digital medium. Um, the next thing that we noticed is that there's a lot of templated business card out there with the digital. So basically you have styles, layouts, all these different things that make it actually um, more cumbersome to have to create a digital business card. Uh, so we think that that's just you know, a little too much. We're basically trying to replicate the physical world in a digital space. Um, and also the next thing is complications and how do you exchange your business cards. So you know, I know there's QR codes, NFC, bump just got bought by Google, that kind of stuff, or shut down I should say. Um, so you know, there's got to be a better way to do this. And these are the things that we thought really isn't making sense and why the digital business cards aren't working. So we're like, we think we have an awesome idea. And that's what we came up with, which is spin card. Okay, so real quick, to address some of these things and try, kind of share a little bit of what spin card is, uh, it's the exchange is with a six character code. It's, you can write it down anywhere, you can memorize it. It's shorter than your phone number, so the intention is you will memorize it. Mine's 3QBSQD. I memorized it within a week. Not just because I use the app a lot, but because it's, it's short, right? So that was the first thing that we wanted to do, is make it really easy to exchange outside of using high-end technology and just kind of keep things on the back end. Uh, the second thing is we wanted to keep simplified profiles. We didn't want to have designs or have it complicated. We just want to make it short and sweet. Here's everybody's contact information presented in a, in a clean way. And then the next thing, which we thought was extremely huge and extremely important, full screen photos of each person on your spin card. Uh, what this means is, is, like I mentioned, we get business cards from people at a lot of different events all the time, more or less, and all these cards don't have faces. Yet, how many people do you remember my name? Honestly, like, okay, not many, but how many people probably remember my face? If you saw me two months from now, would you remember my face? Probably. And you're probably like, who is that guy? I saw him somewhere. Um, that's because we remember faces. And I think it's more important that we focus on the faces for a business card. So that's what we want to do with spin card, is really put a focus on people's face. Because if you remember my face, you'll be able to contact me because you know why you talked about it. Talk with me. So I'm going to try a quick demo here. Hopefully this uh, works all right. So you should see my phone. Okay, so here's spin card. Uh, this is the app. What you can see real quick is you type in somebody's spin here, which is like I said, six characters. Um, when you type in somebody's spin, it'll pop up with more or less a full screen photo such as this. Uh, the intention now is I can just swipe through the faces of the people that I met, and then when I find the person that I'm looking for, 
I can just flip the card over and I have their information. So that's pretty much the entire extent of, flip, of uh, spin card. We want to keep it super simple, an easy way to exchange information, um, and can be remembered. So we want to make sure people are remembered. Uh, so yeah, I mean that's that's my whole presentation. I just wanted to kind of show you guys what we thought with spin card, and I'd like to open up to some questions and see what you guys think. Yes. How do you make money? Yes. Great question. <laughs> I actually have a slide for that, and I anticipated that. Hold on, these are my backup slides. Okay, a couple things I want to touch on. Um, so we, we came up with this idea of a promotional platform. So we actually look at this as, think of it when you go to a store, right? If you go to any um, retail store, how many times do you get asked when you're checking out what's your email address or what's your phone number for, for coupons and, and promotions? Um, so we thought, well, well, this could be easy too, right? So just share six characters and you're connected. Um, so that was the first thing we want to do is actually have a business platform for promotional stuff that would be sold to the retail level. Um, we also wanted to do some type of event registration. You have six characters, it's easy to register for events with that instead of having to create accounts. Um, and then we were also talking about doing um, some in-app purchases and a premium version of the app, such as being able to select your spin code instead of having it auto-generate for you. So those are some of the things that I wanted to share, but we actually have like a laundry list of things that we wanted to try, but these are the ones I just wanted to point out. So, next question. Yes? If you do that, what keeps someone else from stealing your spin card since it's just a six digit <coughs> number of letter code? Sure. Yeah, so there's a couple things that we've talked about. The information that's represented on a, on a spin card should be similar to the information represented on your business card. So it's not extremely sensitive information. We're looking at you know your phone, your email, maybe some you know social media links, um, and that's about it. But we have talked about some other things where we uh, are looking at features of um, mutual uh, agreement where both people have to add each other's spin card, and then you'd be able to see people's information. But right now we're just trying to see how the platform works. Um, we're still rather new. Um, we basically came up with this whole idea around Christmas, so it's like super fast execution and super fast. Um, just getting out there because we want to see we want to <coughs> go too far too fast before people can test it out so, Yes, so how do you generate your initial spin card? For sorry the initial code if you want to have a spin card, so how do you generate the initial code? So when you create an account it's automatically generated for you So when you when you when you actually create an account so it's just your name and your email address and the password and then as soon as you log in um, <coughs> pull this up real quick here If you notice right here on the top, my spin, so 3QB, SQD, um, yours would show up. So as soon as you create an account, you'll, got, you'll come right here to the home screen, and you'll see your, your spin at the top, and that's what you would share. So you, you share six characters, and it's, it's your phone number, email, it's basically whatever you want to share. So it's up to you what you want to put. You can put your Facebook, you can put your Twitter, and you can put your LinkedIn. Those are the only social profiles we offer right now. Um, and then, like I said, like uh, your phone and your email address. So it's, it's more or less public information. Question? Yes. So you know, uh, there have been other apps like this a little bit, like, like Bump, right? Yes. Obviously, which was a little bit easier than, than uh, entering a code. Mm -hmm. And Bump you know, didn't really go very far, right, sure. ultimately. Um, and, and since then, there have been other kind of apps like um, the, the Card Bunch guys, right? They got picked up by LinkedIn. Yep. Um, or, uh, or even like Clear, Clear Slide has their own version of an app like this. Yep. Um, that, uh, um, it's less about kind of about contact management and import, but actually sending people stuff, right? Remembering to send people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, why why aren't you? You know, is there a reason you guys aren't doing something kind of more tied to like like sales or kind of like a more of a, a specific kind of business function than a kind of generic kind of like contact management? Mm -hmm. It seems like you know a lot more of the ads done well are the ones that actually like you know sales people are driving because they yeah. send you something and. They can they connect to like their Salesforce database or you know other CRM. Are you guys thinking about that kind of stuff too? Or? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, one of our things we've talked about is integration to CRM, customer relationship management systems. Um, those are things that we definitely want to do uh, down the road. Uh, the intent right now is to test the market. Like I said, it's a, it's a new product. Um, we're we're starting off really quick, but the intention is to see what people think and then kind of use that feedback to grow the product that way instead of going too far too fast. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean. Well, yeah, we're talking to Zach more about like CRM stuff. Okay. <laughs>
Yes. Why trade a code instead of like a name or an email address? Uh, so short. Sure. Okay. So yeah, we thought a lot about the transaction. Because a transaction right now, the physical business card is here's a piece of paper, right? And we need to keep that as simple as possible. So what we did is we looked at, you know, like I said, all the technologies that are out there, which require people to first understand how what apps or all that kind of thing make it really smooth. Um, six characters is easy to remember. So the idea is you don't need any physical or digital device or anything on you. It'll be in your head, so you'll be able to eventually memorize it. Um, and then it'd be easy to share that way. Thank you. Does that make sense? set up uh, is not an exaggeration to say that H New Tech would not be possible without our uh, sponsors. Uh, first and foremost, our uh, venue sponsor, the University of Michigan Law School uh, Entrepreneurship Clinic. Um, H New Tech was uh, homeless uh, really not that long ago, um, and they've been very generous uh, in providing us with this space, and really, we couldn't do it without you guys, so thank you so much. Um, our other sponsor um, that I should have written down, I believe it's R2 VIVE. Uh, which is the uh, newly formed uh, organization of uh, Roger, our very talented videographer. Um, and our third sponsor is um, A2 Geeks. Um, A2 Geeks is sort of this uh, meta organization that helps facilitate a lot of different uh, geeky events um, in Ann Arbor. Everything from uh, Ignite Ann Arbor, um, A2 New Tech, um, uh, all sorts of uh, different things. Uh, if you're interested, uh, check it out at uh, a2geeks.org. Um, and, uh, up next is uh, Nick to talk about this. <laughs> hey, how y'all doing? My name is Nick Stelter, and I'm the founder of Sports Factory. Uh, simply put, Sports Factory is a Twitter-based web application that aggregates tweets by a sports team. We started development about 13 years ago, or 13 months ago, excuse me. <laughs> 13 years ago for a very long time. <laughs> So for example, if you're a big Detroit Lions fan, you come on to our app, you click on the Detroit Lions, you can see all the tweets from the Lions players and beat writers all in one location. SportsFact provides value to our users in, in multiple ways. For one, we provide access to tweets that someone might not normally have if they weren't, if they don't have a Twitter handle. Uh, this is really key for what we do because we're, our ultimate goal is to bring non-Twitter users to read tweets. Sports Factor provides for a curated experience, a curated sports experience, using tweets as the vehicle for both Twitter users and non-users. As you can see here, this is, the, uh, this is the, the main page of the app, and everything we display on the app is in the form of a tweet. So whether that's a tweet with 140 characters, a tweet with, 100, or a, tweet with a link, or a tweet with a picture, tweets are the, the vehicle that we use to deliver content. And here we have a team page. And as you can see at the top, we have different tabs that allow our users to filter uh, between, um, to filter tweets. So if you click on the beat writer tab, you can see only tweets from that team's beat writers. Or like I just said, if you click on the pics tab or the links tab, you'll see only tweets that contain pictures or links. And finally, the last tab is the position tab. And that kind of acts as an index to uh, the different sports players on certain teams that are on Twitter. <coughs> As with any early stage startup, it's important that you recognize your competitors. This is a good way to validate your, your target market. I'm happy to say that in the last, not 13 years, but in the last 13 months, <laughs> we, we've had two competitors come online. They've been really successful in the early stages of their startups. One's completed a, a rather large round of seed funding, and the other one was accepted and ultimately completed Stanford StartX Accelerator. How to monetize. This is obviously very important. We, we have kind of two paths of monetization for Sports Factory. The first one being a partnership with Twitter in, the, in which we serve promoted, promoted content through our app. Um, you know, this, this, is, this, is the, this is what we're ultimately going for, but like I said, that's going to that's require a partnership with Twitter. We also have a, um, a path to more short-term revenue. Now I'm going to say that kind of jokingly, but every startup needs to disrupt something, and what we're going to disrupt is the box score. If you think about it, the box score hasn't changed in maybe 100 years. You go to your newspaper, you look at the stats, 
and it's very bland. What we plan to do is create infographics like the one you see here, or this one, and we'll take the information from the box scores and then make these infographics easily shareable across all social media platforms. The hope is that these infographics, ooh, that doesn't look very good. Um, the hope is that these, the hope is that these infographics will become the centerpiece for social media conversation. And finally, what, what, are, what are our next steps? For one, we want to continue to develop our Twitter-based content management system. We think this system will provide for um, major advantages over our other competitors. We're also going to integrate with ESPN's API. So I call them three S's, stats, schedules, and standings. And although this is kind of secondary data to what we uh, display on Sports Factory, we think that it will ultimately provide our users with a, with a more full experience and that will make them happy. This is the big one, and this could probably be a presentation within itself, but we're going to try to value tweets. As, as we provide for a curated experience, it's important that we can, we can value individual tweets and ultimately provide for a better experience for users. And finally, we're going to explore funding options. We have a functioning app. It's stable. Uh, this is not an idea. And so hopefully in the future when we find, when we find, um, when we get funded, um, people will see the value proposition in that. They're not, they're not investing in an idea. They're investing in something that's tangible. And ultimately any future funding will, get, will go towards the systems that are needed to monetize the app. Any questions? Yes? So can people tweet from this app, or do they have to have your app open and another Twitter app open in order to share content from that? That's, that's actually a great question. Um, people can't send a tweet like you would on Twitter. Uh, but I don't know, for those familiar with Kyle here, Kyle, are you, where's Kyle? Kyle, yeah. We've actually partnered with Kyle and tchat.io to allow users to chat in real time in, on Twitter. Um, and so that, we, we've had Kyle's um, app as a plug-in on Sports Factory. Uh, and what that allows people to do is, especially with uh, real-time, or not real-time, with, um, with game-specific hashtags. So if you see, like, you know, hashtag DET versus uh, CHI, that would be Detroit versus Chicago. Um, that's where we think Kyle's app becomes really popular in that you can uh, use that to communicate with people while you're on Twitter. Yes? As a uh, reader or user of your application, can I organize the tweets by topic? Uh, people are talking about whatever, a certain player or a certain action or whatever. Sure, uh, you currently can't do that, but that's a great idea. Um, you know, we can go, we can take this app in a lot of different ways. Right now, we just monitor uh, Twitter handles, and then we save them in the database, and we display them uh, based on what team they're assigned in that database. Uh, you know, in the future, uh, you know, we, we plan to get into more complex things like you just mentioned. Yes? What would be your plan for generating the infographics? What, what I mean, is that an automatic function or is that something that requires paid humans? <laughs> That's another great question. Um, we're, we're still kind of tossing around ideas, um, but you know, obviously crowdsourcing is very big right now. and. Um, you know, the way I see uh, Sports Factor providing value is, is we create a library of templates, you know, that, that kind of pre-approved infographics, and then we'll, we'll pay someone a nominal amount to uh, actually come and fill it in. Yes? Um, how many, uh, if you're looking to monetize through eyeballs, um, how many potential users are in the how, uh, big is the, how, big, how big is your potential user base? Well, we, we've been developing this over the last 13 months, and, and uh, we, we're kind of just coming out of stealth phone right now, but uh, I can say that one of our competitors uh, averages about uh, a million monthly visits. Uh, so if that answers your question, then... How many and unique users? How many unique users? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I really couldn't tell you off the top of my head, uh, but we are averaging about five to ten impressions per visit. Yes. How did you tackle the real-time side of things technically? Technically? Um, well, actually, I've been developing this app with uh, Steve Shorts and Scott here at El Django. Um, 
And I'd probably feel a little more comfortable if Steve wants to stand up and then maybe take that question, <laughs> just so that we can uh, make sure to give you the accurate information. Sure. We're, uh, you're talking about processing the tweets in real time? Yeah. Yeah, we, uh, on the back end, we have it hooked up to Twitter's real-time streaming API using uh, Ruby on the machine right now. Um, so I don't know how much more, but it's, it's basically we have, it's two apps kind of in one. There's the web app that you actually interface with and you see all the tweets and you can like favorite tweets and everything from it. And then there's the real time piece on the back end that's hooked up to the Twitter API um, that's fully asynchronous. Does that answer your question? Yeah, that's right. All right, cool. <laughs> Do you have a marketing strategy for expanding your user base? That's a great question. Um, we currently don't. We're, we're just kind of coming out. Um, you know, we're, we're just uh, we're looking to get um, you know more people on the app in any way possible. I, I think uh, right now we've just been spreading by word of mouth, and um, the people that have used the app seem to have really liked it, and um, they seem to be willing to recommend it to their friends. So that's that's a key indicator. Yes, you thought about targeting people in the media. Like, if you're a reporter covering the Lions, this would be obviously useful to, to them. You know? Yes, absolutely. And that kind of uh, gets uh, gets back to our value of tweets. We could see some type of subscription-based service where we we assign a value to a tweet. Let's say from a, a scale of zero to a hundred, with hundred being the most valuable. And so ultimately we could sign up uh, beat writers or people uh, that work at newspapers and we could provide a service that, that filters through kind of some of the noise on Twitter and kind of provides them with um, just the, the tweets that they want to see. Yes? Why wouldn't you just make the value in the traffic? I'm sorry, what was that? Why wouldn't you just make the value in the traffic? The more people that are wanting to go to this specific tweet, that's obviously more popular. And that's the way yeah, I don't know if we have uh, the ability to tell, um, you know, which tweets uh, people go to. We can, uh, you know, it's more of just a, a page of tweets, and so we can't really tell uh, which tweet that someone's looking at. But we think we'll be able to value tweets by uh, forecasting retweets. That um, that kind of answers your question. Also, by the time the tweet's popular, it's too late to give a value. Twitter can give you that value. The real value is predicting the Thanks. Go. Okay, one of the great things about um, HU Tech uh, is that uh, unlike a lot of um, entrepreneurial events where they're like, oh no, you know, we don't want you trying to coach your developers or anything like that. Well, almost any announcement that's pertaining to entrepreneurship is welcome here. Uh, and so after this presentation, uh, we're going to uh, open up the floor uh, briefly for community announcements. So if there's an upcoming hackathon, if there's uh, job openings uh, you want to talk about, um, or if there's a startup that just launched or just reached a milestone that you want to talk about, um, please uh, have that stuff in mind uh, for the break between the presentations. Okay, uh, and uh, up next, um, uh, Scott is going to be ruminating on if there's some things that are better not known. <laughs> Take it away, Scott. Still my first joke, Dan. <laughs> well, let me see if I can get my presentation up first. Don't start the timer yet, please. Oh. I, got it. I don't know if I have to pull this over here. One upcoming event uh, that I guess I'll announce right now is that there is a, um, a, a open data civic hackathon. Um, actually, it's happening at All Hands Active, and I believe that's happening uh, this Monday. Uh, so if you're interested in uh, open data and open government, um, something to check out at uh, 7 p.m. All right, now I'm ready for Scott. I'm ready now. All right. So hi, my name is Scott Gosey. I'm a developer at Alpha Django, and I'm here to present to you today healthinspection.info. So let me give you a little bit of background. Uh, about a year ago, I came across an article on AnnArbor.com. I can't find that article because AnnArbor.com is gone, so <laughs> this isn't live. But let's pretend for a second that this is that article. And uh, in that article, they had a list of restaurants that had recently had health inspection reports. And I saw my favorite restaurant there, and I was like, oh, good, let's see what, oh, God, what happened. <laughs> Needless to say, it's not my favorite restaurant. So as I continued, 
uh, I became fascinated with what other favorite restaurants I had might not be so great to go to. Uh, so I followed the link on the website, and it took me to a website that looked like this. Uh, it's Sword Solutions website that basically hosts a lot of the health inspection websites. And as you can tell, it's not a very pretty website. Uh, even after searching things, it was just very hard to find the uh, restaurants and other places I wanted to at a glance that I wanted to see the health inspector reports for. And the results page, you know, didn't look much better. It was just very kind of hard to read. It, it, was, it just wasn't that great. So uh, I did what any developer would do with a weekend and no social life. I uh, decided to build something better. So within three days, I uh, had the basic app up. It was just a Twitter bootstrap with like, you know, connected to Google. Uh, but I really didn't really need to tell anybody about it. Uh, it just kind of languished and uh, it was just something I whipped up in a weekend. So uh, for about a year, I just didn't really do anything with it. Uh, but that's no longer the case. With the help of Kevin, our amazing designer in Alpha Django, I took another weekend uh, I seriously have no social life, I guess. Uh, uh, completely overhauled it, and I'm here to present to you to uh, present to you today and ask one question: Health Inspection Info. What are you eating? <laughs> so uh, let's take a quick demo of the app. So this is uh, the website you can access right now is at Health Inspection Info, and the, it's a pretty. Uh, basic site in the sense that it uses your phone, your computer's geolocation to find restaurants around you and show you which ones have health inspection reports. So I can click this place right near me and I can see Upper Crust Food Service at Kai Chai Frat uh, had a health incident. And so the idea basically is you can then click on it and get a more detailed view of what the health inspection reports in that area. And you, uh, so when you're out with your friends, you can take a quick look around and say, uh, let's see, what's around me? And then look up on your app and see the, the restaurants that have health inspection reports and then say, all right, we're not going to this place, this place, and this place. So uh, there's more to the site than that, though. Uh, you can just go right up here and you can type in uh, Chop House, let's say, because hopefully they're doing pretty good. And uh, it pulls up like a quick view of any uh, restaurants, health inspection reports at a glance. And if you want to drill down, you can just click down here and kind of see a, a specific health inspection report, what the comments were, things like that. Uh, we also have an establishments tab up here, and that's kind of your quick way to see all restaurants at a glance. Uh, it's using right now uh, a plugin to kind of filter the table. Most people use a, a, a plugin called Dynata uh, D uh, Data Tables, excuse me, but Alpha Django's created this cool thing called Dyna Tables that if you've ever worked with Data Tables, you'll, you'll love. Uh, but here you can see kind of at a glance all the restaurants that have health inspection reports in Ann Arbor. And I've created this little column over here called the Severity Index. And uh, basically what you can do is if you want to sort by how bad has somebody fucked up cooking? <laughs> <laughs> See, maybe I'm not going to eat a Toyo with technical <laughs> so, This is why they yeah. So I, I have one last feature that I'm kind of excited to. Uh, I built it last night, so uh, if things go wrong, I'm so sorry. Uh, but the idea is basically I now have a Chrome extension that I built in a night at the store. So now when you're searching for restaurants in Ann Arbor, it'll actually add it straight to the information about the restaurant. So let's type in, uh, let's see. Pizza House. A pizza House, that's a good one. <laughs> you and you can see right down here, it adds it straight to the page. So that way I can go down here, I can click it, and it takes me right back to it. So uh, that's my app, basically. And uh, if you have any questions, you can ask me anywhere. At, uh, you can ask me afterwards. And if you want to grab a bite to eat afterwards, the, uh, maybe not. But <laughs> that's it, though. this uh, statistics gets into the rating of a restaurant, like you know, you go to Yelp or something, you have a five star rating, um, is that integrated? I, I get very nervous about rating restaurants based on health, health inspection reviews because some places don't be reviewed very often because they're seasonal. Other times uh, they could have critical incidences but they clear it up very quickly. So if you start building a rating or like a judgment of the restaurant itself, it starts to become very tricky because you start saying like, hey, this place isn't a good place to eat, where that might not be the case. So I've, I've, cre I've created that kind of 
severity index and kind of let that let that be as general as possible so that restaurants don't come and sue me. So <laughs> yes. Does Sword Solutions know you're scraping them? And if so, um, oh, no, yeah. is there a license in place and is it an exclusive? And if not, are they going to shut you down? Um, they can shut me down. I have no money. So. <laughs> but the general idea is uh, they don't know, but I, uh, I made it OK in my mind by saying <laughs> reports are usually public service things that are provided by the department, and I consider that uh, a good enough reason that they'd probably be okay with it. Right, so, I'm not Bryce, but he's wanting to read that EULA now. Yeah. Um, other questions? Yes. Yeah. I was going to ask if you've looked into any other cities that you're looking to do this with, or are you sticking with Ann Arbor? Uh, Ann Arbor right now, but the idea basically is, I didn't call it Ann Arbor Health Inspections that info, I called it Health Inspections that info, so I'm hoping that I could kind of get out the word at events kind of like this, and hopefully if people are interested in, in showing me other sites I can scrape and, and take the data from, <laughs> I, can, I can add it to the website and, and they can search for places near them too. Yes? I noticed you have a, a new TLD.info. Uh, how'd you go about grabbing that, I guess? Um, name registrar, name chief, I think, offers you to buy uh, info, you know, dot info, and I, I couldn't believe that health inspection dot info was available, so I grabbed it at the earliest opportunity, yeah. Perfect. Any other questions? Oh, yes. It sounds like you're doing this for more of a public good kind of thing, but are you thinking of ways to monetize it or no? It's a good question, and uh, you're right in the sense that I originally built it kind of just for the public good, in the sense that uh, right now, if you want to look up health inspectors' points, there just wasn't a great way to do it before this. And so this kind of let you uh, look up at a glance information that was important to you. Um, I've thought about monetizing it. This has really just been a couple weekend project, once a year ago and now once now. But um, the hope is that you could get monetization values with it. Again, I, I, I get worried because it, uh, if I'm scraping somebody else's data and then I start making money, then I become a bigger target, where right now I'm just so fluffy and good because I'm doing that in public good. Uh, but uh, there are some monetization possibilities there. You could have your rating, kind of like he, he suggested, next to the website to say, like, look how little incidents we have, how, look how many health reports you have. It'd be very useful. Too. So there is some strategies there, but I haven't fully mapped them out yet, basically. In the back. If you, if you don't plan to make money, uh, what is your plan for the next few years? Are you still going to continue this? I have some disposable income. I, I always like to, you know, if there, I could find a way to do something better, I don't really care if it costs me money, or, as long as it doesn't cost me too much money. And this, and this is on a, a Heroku instance. I, I upgraded the, the Postgres database, so it's about 10 bucks a month. I can afford that. So I'll, I'll keep it up as long as I can. And if somebody wants to take it, uh, take it over after I'm done with it, like the moment I'm married. So. Yes, uh, yes in the back. Uh, have you received any any response from the local restaurants? And how do you intend to respond to requests to remove that information? Uh, should you receive that? Well, it's, it's public information, so I don't know how much you can actually remove. Um, but in terms of actually getting restaurants known, uh, not really, just because I let it, like I said, I let it language for about a year. It was out there, I just didn't really do anything with it. So nobody really knew about it. And I kept seeing these Ann Arbor.com, now M Live articles, talking about health inspection reports. And they kept listing it in like this, you know, this very bad view. And I was like, come on, they're asking. I, I want to get this out there and show people that there's a better way. Um, but yeah, that's the, that's the main. Yeah, you should just charge them. You know, add, add a discuss coming. Oh yeah, people. come in like, and then we'll we'll get it from the website. Make 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 the first search. It's not, it's not extortion if it's public information. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> right, well, we got a business model for it. So. We, we got one last yeah. quick time for a question, if possible. Uh, I'm just wondering if something like this could be incorporated into something like Yelp, you know, when you're looking for restaurants, you know, and then have a link to your your website. I don't know if they'd want to do that or not because it's. I can make a Chrome extension that updates it at least that could add it, kind of insert it the way I do in the Google search uh, on Yelp.com. So at the very least, I could do that. I doubt Yelp would probably want restaurants fleeing away from them because they offer health inspection. In California, well. they have the, like... They do? Like, eight plus, you know, they have letter grade. Yeah, the letter grade. Yeah, in there, I know. So, I guess they already do that in some cities, but yeah, yeah, that'd be cool. Rating. Or what? Come up with the letter rating, yeah. 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 Thank you. Cool.
community announcements. Uh, often we have quite a few of them, so please try to keep them to 15 or 20 seconds. Uh, upcoming events, job openings. Yes. Got the GLEQ uh, business competition for the spring is open now. They merged and they're now MI Quest, but it's still a GLEQ business plan competition that's open through the 31st of March to register. Plans are due uh, Wednesday, May 14th, and the awards will be here in Ipsy um, June 17th. Uh, they broadened what they're interested in. It's not so uh, focused anymore, um, thanks to the, the, the CEO at Bigby, who is part of the board. Um, so, if anybody's interested in uh, educational resources, interacting with coaches, uh, and getting yourself exposure in front of investors, um, we've got cards here and up at the front. Right here. Other announcements, upcoming events? Yeah. Yeah, this week is uh, Detroit Week, uh, which is focused on entrepreneurship in Detroit. And there's a few different events. Um, there's actually one tomorrow called Best Startup in Detroit at um, Grand Circus. And then there is a, another event called 50 Founders, which there's a, a talk, I can't remember the guy's name, um, but he's talking at Bamboo Detroit. So there's two events um, in Detroit tomorrow and Thursday. Other announcements? Yeah, Wes. So uh, on the 5th of March, the BioArmor is going to be on Quantified Self. It's uh, the proliferation of sensors, that kind of stuff. Um, if you didn't even know Body Media, it uh, was acquired by Jawbone. The founder of Body Media, uh, who's now vice president of R&D for Jawbone, is going to be one of the speakers along with uh, one of our faculty members at the University of Michigan in the School of Medicine, um, Kevin Ward, talking about how we're using this kind of information, the up bands, the fifth bits, the body media to, to quantify ourselves and what does that mean for the future of healthcare. So it's kind of an interesting topic for, for this room as well. And that's at Spark um, and on the 5th, you can go to bioarbor.org. Yeah, I guess Yeah, um, Metro Workspace out of Livonia just opened a new office. We're now in Farmington also. So great place for tech guys that are in Ann Arbor. Uh, my name is Jason. I'm the uh, co-founder of a startup called Regango. We're actually one of the best startup competition companies that have been selected to pitch tomorrow. Uh, we're actually looking to link with uh, Ruby developers and also front-end CSS and uh, uh, JavaScript developers. Um, so if you're interested, please come talk to us. We'd love to talk with you about what we've got going on. Okay, great. I think uh, we're going to let uh, Diana take it from here, um, but we'll maybe have some more time for announcements um, after uh, her presentation in the Q&A section. Uh, take it away. Hey guys, how's it going? My name is Diana Chen and I'm the founder of Law Studio. Do any of you guys know what the legal market is valued at as of today in the United States? It's a $300 billion market. And to help you wrap your mind around what $300 billion means, I did some research and found a few things that you could buy with $300 billion. You could buy an entire nation. You would buy 300,000 Michigan stadiums. Or if you're feeling extra generous, you could sponsor three and a half million out-of-state kids to get their undergrad degree from Michigan. That's a lot of value, and with a lot of value comes a lot of potential. Now, while the, while the legal services, legal market has been uh, increasing the demand for legal services has been e increasing. The demand for specific law firm services has been going down. So here's the problem. Legal work is too expensive and too inefficient. The market for legal services has rapidly shifted from large corporations with a ton of capital to smaller businesses and startups with very little capital but a much bigger interest in innovation and efficiency. That's where Law Studio comes in. Law Studio is the first and only online crowdsourcing platform for small businesses and startups to find affordable and efficient legal help. We have taken a basic crowdsourcing platform which has gained substantial popularity in certain fields such as graphic design and freelance work and applied it to professional services. By allowing attorneys to bid on the legal work, we're able to present clients with the, most, the lowest market rates as well as expose them to a wide array of talented attorneys that they might not otherwise come across. So how exactly does it work? I went through the process and took a few screenshots of it to uh, show you this in, in a few minutes. Once you create an account online, the next thing you'll want to do is post a request for legal work. And to do that, all you have to do is put in a short description of what it is you're looking for, 
set your budget, set your timeline and your deadlines, and set how long you want your posting to remain live on the site. Once that gets sent out, all you have to do is wait for the bids to come in, and as the bids come in, you can review them. Also, while you're waiting, you can feel free to browse through all the attorney profiles. So for instance, this is attorney John Smith. He's an attorney from Ann Arbor, Michigan, University of Michigan grad, has been practicing for 14 years. You can see that he has a very uh, diverse range of expertise, anywhere from business formation to IP work to tax work. He's licensed in Michigan, carries about practice insurance. You can see all this information about attorney John Smith. And if you see this information and decide that, you know, this is the perfect attorney for you, you can actually invite John to bid on your services. Now, once an attorney bids for your service and you decide to hire them, then the transaction begins and the entire transaction takes place online through our online platform. So far, we have email functionalities on our platform. We have file upload, uh, such as drop, like similar to Dropbox or Google Drive. We just put up our real-time online chat. We actually just released that yesterday. And we are working on building out a, an online video conferencing platform similar to Skype. So you can really conduct all your business from the comfort of your own home or from literally anywhere in the world as long as you have Wi-Fi. So with all that said, when you get home today, create a profile, upload your jobs for legal work, and join us in reinventing the legal system. Thank you. Questions? Yep. Uh, I really like the idea. That's really smart. Uh, depending on the type of work, are, are you forcing people to do it all online, or can I still meet with the attorney if I want? You know, because I just want confidential information. You know, what, how are you guys going to protect it if I'm uploading, you know, sensitive documents? Yeah. So to answer your question, first of all, there's going to be a feature on there after you complete the transaction. You can choose to download all the documents to your personal computer and then delete it from from the online system. So it can be deleted from there forever. Um, if you do you want to meet up with your attorney face to face, that's definitely an option. You can communicate that between your attorney. It's we're not forcing people. The reason we we have the online real time chat and the video chat is just for efficiency and to streamline the process. How do how do I distinguish? You know, like I get all these bids from different lawyers. How do I distinguish which one I want to choose? You know, like what, what criteria am I going to use? Yeah, so the first thing you'll look at is probably the price and see how that lines up with your budget. And then each attorney is going to have a profile online, just like we saw with attorney John Smith. So you can go on there and see you know, how many years of experience they have, what kinds of work they've done in the past, and all this information. And with you know, all this information, you can decide which one is the best fit. Um, yeah, I don't know who asked that, but that is actually one of our functions as well. We didn't see it up there, but once a client has used an attorney, that attorney is going to have a rating on their profile, similar to what you see on Yelp. And so you can see whether past clients have enjoyed working with this person or not. Right there. Um, do you do any validation on the credentials that the lawyers are putting in, or um, so that or people putting in fake reviews or anything? The only validation we do is we verify that they're actually a bar attorney and not just some random person that's saying they're, they're an attorney. Beyond that, we don't do any validation, and part of that is because we do have the rating system, so it's kind of a natural vetting process. If clients end up not liking the attorney, they'll get bad ratings and eventually just fall off the site. Yeah, yeah how many bids are you seeing per post on average? So we actually just launched a month ago, um, and so right now we've been working on gathering our attorney base, and then. <clears throat> just starting to target our client base now. So it's still a very new process. We don't have enough data for that yet, uh, but that's something that we hope to really get going. So, so you do a lot, you know, like you, you look at all the things that you have, there's like a lot of things that you guys are doing that, uh, you know, Skype and Google and a whole bunch of other folks also do. Um, and in my experience, you know, most lawyers actually aren't all that tech savvy, you know, they're, they're not necessarily the, folks I'd imagine would, would, would jump to a platform like this. Um, and, and uh, you know, there are other companies, like even locally, there's a, 20, a company in Detroit called Stick, um, stik.com, that's basically just doing sort of the, uh, kind of two-star marketplace for, um, 
kind of they, they just kind of arbitrage a lot of the recommendations and client recommendations to other folks. They don't have to provide any of those kind of any of the functionality providing questions about the secure data room and credentialing and all that stuff. Um, wh why do so much? You know, why not just kind of focus on like one one piece of that maybe that would be uh, you know, a little easier to pull off. Yeah, so first, as you mentioned, there's definitely a gap between where lawyers are operating and their mindset, which is very much stuck in, you know, 20 years ago, and where entrepreneurs are today, which is the their next uh, market, essentially. And so this, we, did the, we do all these things because we want this to be in a, the full experience, you know. So if you were to go and find a lawyer at a law firm, get the whole experience, you can get this here. And the way that we're thinking about doing this is kind of thinking about redoing the whole way that people uh, do legal transactions. So we're moving it completely to online, and you're right, a lot of the, especially some of the older attorneys are, you know, are maybe not be, may not be the most receptive to a service like this, but I think there's definitely a big demand for that out there, and I think that this is where, you know, everyone is gonna be 10 years down the line. How large is your attorney database? So far, we have about 50 attorneys. Um, again, we've only been up and running for a month, and so that's something that we're con continually working on. Geographic area that you're focusing on? We started focusing on just Illinois and Michigan. We're actually based out of Chicago. Um, but recently, we've expanded to, we've decided to do a nationwide rollout, and so we're going to be targeting all, uh, all areas. Um, I'd imagine with lawyers like doctors, the reason why they got into that profession is to be kind of a high price per hour. And with you doing a bidding system model, you're kind of turning that on its head and actually allowing for consumers to choose a, or a lawyer based off of the lowest price in a sense. Have you talked with the lawyers in terms of their feedback long term? Because I'm thinking long term, this might be something that some lawyers are going to kick back and say, okay, well, the reason why I'm not going to use that system is because I can normally bid at, uh, you know, my jobs for $150, $200 an hour but because I'm in a bidding war, I now have to now cut my prices down in half. Have you found it to be that lawyers are struggling for work that much that they're willing to cut their rates? Uh, actually, yeah. So first of all, we're not trying to devalue lawyer services at all. Um, the mere fact of it is that the rate that a lot of lawyers are charging out, which is, you know, at a big firm, lawyers are easily billing out at $500 an hour, and it's simply not worth that much. The work can be done for less than that. And it's not devaluing it, and a lot of law students today are actually coming out without jobs, you know, and even some of the older attorneys that I've spoken with who have worked at, in big firms for years are, are realizing that the market is changing and they want to get on this, but they don't have the clients, you know, they don't know where to go, go about looking for clients, and so they can jump on this website and get outside clients on the side and diversify their client base. Thank you. Uh, were there any other committee announcements? Yes. So, uh, I'm starting a software company, who isn't, right? And I'm looking for a co-founder to uh, uh, help me build a technical support organization. If you're interested, uh, come find me after the meeting. I know I haven't been in the center of yet. Uh, I'm Dan. I'm part of an automation infrastructure company based in Toledo House called Petricorp. Uh, I run a, a meetup for Toledo Toledo Web Designers and Developers, uh, Toledo Web Professionals, designtoledo.com, uh, we're down in Toledo, so don't forget about us, I know everything's about Ann Arbor and Detroit, but <laughs> we're still down there, so, and, and things are happening, it's exciting down there, so we'd like to see uh, some new faces down there, so talk to me if you want more details, designtoledo.com, thanks. Uh, I'm Patrick, um, this Thursday at uh, Coffee House Coders, I'm going to be giving a talk on uh, moving away from using pixels as the primary measurement for building websites and in the process making websites better able to deal with all the different screen sizes that are out there. Um, that's this Thursday, 6 o'clock at Work and Tile Exchange over on uh, Main Street and that's part of uh, Coffee House Coders. And uh, I'm also from Toledo and uh, there's a website called ToledoTechEvents.org that aggravates all the tech related, tech related events around Toledo uh, in case you're interested, so that's another good resource. I forgot to mention, I got spin buttons, spin card buttons, if anybody wants one after. <laughs> I just wanted to share. Awesome. 
Uh, the, one other thing that I wanted to uh, say is that um, this will be our uh, our uh, last presentation uh, for tonight. Um, stick around afterwards. Usually, there's quite a bit of uh, uh, mingling going on and people asking uh, follow, follow questions, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and so, um, and then occasionally, after about 15 or 20 minutes of that, uh, we end up um, going to uh, some venue afterwards for sort of an after party. Um, is there an interest in that this time again? Or is anyone not scared away from Pizza House? <laughs> is willing to brave the uh, the beer is probably still so fine. The is so fine. <laughs> okay, so let's uh, let's tentatively plan on uh, uh, after everyone has a chance to sort of uh, ask their follow questions, uh, maybe at uh, Pizza House for uh, for a bit of an after party. Okay, um, I am extremely excited uh, for our final uh, presenter. Um, a uh, company right in our backyard that I believe just filed for 501c3 status. Yes. So we tried not to make money. Yeah. <laughs> well, of course, there's, there's many different objectives for a company. It's not profitable by design. Yeah. Please <laughs> welcome the. the, the <laughs> Real quick, there's soup. Is a fundraiser this Sunday. There's four or five groups that usually apply for it, but local awesome organizations this Sunday, 6 p.m. at live. One of them is the Grange Junior Makers. They make awesome kits and programs for kids to make stuff. So check out Soup at Live this Sunday. So get food yeah. and you get to help out some nonprofit that deserves it. We're going to spend our entire five minutes talking about other things other than all hands yeah. up. So, <laughs> so here's the deal. Uh, this is Josh. I'm Nate. And over here is uh, Larry and Martin. Uh, we are part of All Hands Active. It's Ann Arbor's Hackerspace. And for those of you who are not familiar with the Hackerspace, it's pretty much a space where you go and you be creative. However that is, we have lots of tools, we have lots of people who are very smart, who collect there, and we do things that are incredibly fun and, and also very educational. We help the community with uh, education. Have you, have you ever needed a tool that you just didn't have, and you were like, sweet, I'm going to use this tool once and never use it again? Has anybody done that? Cool. I've got a cordless drill that my wife and I bought three years ago, and we've used it all maybe like 10 hours. It just sits there, not doing anything. Um, has anyone here made something recently? Raise your hand if you've made something recently. All of you who don't have your hands up are lying. <laughs> One, you have kids. If you've made kids, uh, you've made kids. <laughs> Hopefully you also made love at the same time too, but you don't need to go in that. Have you made breakfast? Have you had, does anyone here consider themselves a hacker of some sort? Awesome. Has anyone here modified a recipe? Cool. So that's another example of hacking. So hacking, making what all these sorts of unused activities. brains. Uh, monkey brains? Unused brains. Unused brains? Unused. Uh, we ate brains, I guess, a month or two ago down at the shop. That seems weird. They were actually insects. But insects have sort of like a nervous system in brains. So we, we modified food and we were eating mealworms and other things. Uh, we have uh, art party. Can you do like a 10 second just on what art party is? Uh, when's the last time you've drawn or uh, done anything creative or painted or anything. Was it in high school? Was it in middle school? Uh, we have a night where you just come down and you just relax, listen to some music, and draw or paint. Step away from the screen for a little bit, uh, just relax and uh, paint. Other things, uh, we help an organization called Back Your Brains out. They do a lot of their production down at our facility. So, you know, they need a place where they can access soldering irons and tools and laser cutters, things of that nature, to help build some of their products that they then sell. Uh, they could either lease out an entire office space, which they've done for some of their work, but finding a space where you can do that without going through all the steps, hoops, and fun rental process to run a facility like that, we have an option for smaller companies that are doing small quantities of production as well. So it's everyone from, you know, six-year-old kids coming down learning about electronics for the first time to, you know, people as old as you can possibly imagine learning, relearning, or sharing skills that they know to businesses and small organizations. Um, what else do we have? Coursera. Coursera has been a really interesting thing. How many people are familiar with Coursera? Cool. Uh, we started having a couple groups, and I think, Larry, you're running one of the Coursera groups. It's the Audio Fundamentals Electronics course, where the uh, build project for that, if you choose to do it, you don't have to be able to play an instrument, but you will build a practice electric guitar amp, and you will understand, and it starts with what is sound, right up to how does that cabinet make the sound out the speaker. and. You will buy the materials for it, but all of the materials for the course, the actual courseware, just the regular web conference things through Coursera. But the nice thing about it is you have a community, there's a few people down there with you, as Josh said, you don't need to buy the tools. We have the saws, we have the screws, we have the part. You'll buy the part just for your thing, and then you can do that. And we also have another one, SparkFun, Lisa's running. It is a small robotics course, 
Uh, there's SparkFun. How many are you familiar with SparkFun? Okay. There's a, a little robotics that will respond to sound, and they're learning and exploring that. And uh, I guess last is not Coursera, but we just had backyard brains down there build robo roaches for a uh, filmmaking. In fact, Doug was there with his son. And what that was, if you haven't heard of it, is Backyard Brains has the cockroach cyborg. And they built one, and the kids were from about fourth grade up through freshman in high school. And they're talking about brains and neurons, and they're wiring these. And, you know, a couple of parents are a little freaked out about the cockroaches, but they got to drive them, including a fellow who had cerebral palsy. He doesn't have a lot of motor control. But watching him do that, and that was for a Schrodinger's cat is a Norwegian film science series, been going 25 years, and we're gonna be on the air, well, AHA will be on the air, but Backyard Brains is the focus. So we have a space you can use for these kinds of things, and if you just wanna make origami, Martin's Art Night is the place to do that. You just show up and people will join you. Trust About me. 25 East Liberty, it's right across the street from the back door, next to the Michigan Theater. Sweet. Yeah. Questions. All right, questions. There's this list up here. Um, there's a bunch of people that are missing, uh, yeah. but what I find fascinating, I don't really even want to talk about AHA or get questions from AHA yeah. if that's possible. All those green places are places that are within like a two minute walk of All Hands Active. So I find it really fascinating over the past year that places like Pinocchio, TechR, Menlo, Spark, Build, Create, Barracuda, Thingsmiths, Backyard Brains, the Penny Stamps Lectures, and an organization called Game Start School are all within literally like a minute walk from us. There's like this whole like geek street thing happening downtown Ann Arbor. And I don't know if that's happening officially, I've done no research on this, but I love the fact that so much of that is happening downtown Ann Arbor, and I'd love to see more of that happening. So how do we make that happen? Or just ask a spot. Just guide, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was sort of a thinking question. Yes? Um, I love the equipment. Um, what type of equipment do you have? Um, do, you, do you have oscilloscopes, six gens, yes. stuff like that? Okay. Oscilloscopes, soldering irons, 3D printers, laser cutter, bandsaw. Oh, we don't have a bandsaw. We're gonna we do have a bandsaw. We do have a bandsaw. We did get a bandsaw. Scroll saw. Scroll saw. We have a drill press. I mean, we, we have loud, noisy tools. And we have and electronics and Arduinos. If you want to play with Arduinos, you just heard about it. We have kids you can come down and play with, and we do have classes. So look at our best website. Come on, check it, <laughs> check it out, and see. So do you guys do anything with Raspberry Pis? We do have them down there. Um, some people are down there messing with them. We probably have about three or four people in an average month coming down playing with them that we have. I have no clue how many people bring their own and play with them down there, but we do have them down there for people to play, mess around with for free. Yes. For those who wonder what a Raspberry Pi is, it's a little computer about the size of a credit card. Runs Linux, and you can buy it for 35 bucks. It has HDMI input, so you can build a very low-cost Linux computer based on it. One of the things we did not mention about our space, and I put one of these on the bullet board if you want to take a picture. It's got the, the website. We have open build times from Thursday through Sunday from 2 to 10 p.m. Open build means you bring your project. We take donations because we're a nonprofit, but we don't charge you for that. Yes. I think hands-on training is fantastic. It's really important. You can't be just behind the keyboard all your life. Um, what kind of uh, support do you need? What's on your wish list? How can people help? Great question. Uh, <laughs> for that With the filing of the 501c3, uh, the timing went up a little bit from when it used to be. It was a six-month process. We're told it's now back down to an eight-month. The government shutdown really directly affected that processing of those applications. However, that said, with our filing in now, we expect to be tax-deductible donation ready by the end of the year. And regardless, we're always accepting donations of any size, literally. And I should put a plug in here for the new center. The new Enterprise Work Center was critical in helping us get our paperwork together, helping us with the bylaws. Yeah, equipment you wish you had, but don't. Equipment is harder because we have a limited amount of space. Mm -hmm. So depending on uh, what you're talking about, I mean, I'd love to have a solder or a a welding rig down there, but unfortunately it's in a basement. Yeah. There's no ventilation, ventilation really, so. I, if, you, if you've got ideas yeah, though, we'll ideas. Yeah. totally talk with you. Oh, and if, if you're swapping out your equipment before you throw it in a dumpster, recycle it, please give us a call and give us a first refusal on that, because we'd like to upgrade too. We just can't afford to go out and get it things. In the back. How are you handling safety? So we've got all these amazing machines, but... That's, so that's, that's a beautiful question. Carefully. And the, the, the basic answer is the community. 
Um, we've got a lot of tools down there and a strong effort from us to give people the easiest access to these machines and tools as possible. On the other hand, you don't want people losing their limbs because that's bad and it's still pretty hard to reattach them. We have 3D printers, but they don't print flesh yet. Some people's do, ours don't. Um, so the short answer is we ask people to keep an eye out for themselves. We have multiple safety kits. Uh, we have a wonderful young lady, Anna, who comes down and does hackerspace first aid lessons. So she's a registered nurse. She's put together classes, workshops that we can take to understand how to take care of ourselves once an injury has occurred. But beyond that, we ask people to use things that they know how to use. And if they don't know, to ask someone. That sounds like a horrible thing to some people. To other people, they're like, oh yeah, cool. You don't have to go through a month of certification before you use this tool. So far, we've had zero calls to the hospital. I think we've had zero injuries. <laughs> Um, but, uh, cool. but yeah, so we do when when we do have the classes and when kids are involved in that, their parents are generally there. They're overseeing it. We don't just say, "Here's a soldering iron, go to town." <laughs> we show them how to do that because all of us have been burned or got nicked at some point. So. I, I heard through the grapevine um, that one way to uh, support you on a recurring basis is to become a member. How do I become a member of All Hands Active? We have so we have <laughs> 40 hours a week. We're open to the public for free. If you want 24-7 access, you can pay a rate between $20 and $50 a month, and that gets you a key and a code 24-7 access to the facility. And that's a great way to support us, even if you don't come down. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, guys. Please stick around so you can ask Okay, that concludes our official programming. Uh, we're always looking for uh, new presenters. Um, if you're interested in presenting in a future month, uh, please either come see me or email info, or sorry, organizers at a2newtech.org. That's organizers at a2newtech.org. Uh, otherwise, hope to see you at uh, Pete House in a little bit. Thanks, everyone. Yeah.